you very much. So tonight I'm going to talk about uh, nature and agriculture, seemingly two very different subjects. But I hope to be able to show you, ultimately, um, how we can use nature to help agriculture. Um, so basically, I started my career as a naturalist um, many years ago. And I think the first slide shows how many years ago. 1970, a long time ago, I knew I was a naturalist. I was a naturalist a few years before this, actually, which is a, a clip from a no local newspaper where I was promoting the use of stinging nettles as a, as a food plant for butterflies and encouraging the local council in England, as you can tell from my accent, um, not to cut nettles down so that the butterflies can thrive. And I find myself doing the same thing today. Um, I recently wrote a paper about the benefits of stinging nettles to butterflies and to beneficial insects. Um, so I've been a naturalist for a long time, but um, and butterflies were what brought me into entomology and what made me a researcher. Um, but unfortunately, uh, it's, it's a rare person that can get a job as a, a butterfly person. Uh, to get paid chasing butterflies is, is a dream that um, many boys have or did have in England at that time. And, and it doesn't come true. Um, but I wanted a career in science. And so the next best thing was agriculture. Um, and unfortunately, England at that time didn't offer me a job in agriculture. So I emigrated um, to Australia. Um, and agriculture, I soon found, is nature um, in a way. And of course, primitive agriculture was very much nature. Um, it's only with our progress, so-called, um, and development of agriculture to make it more economical and more productive, um, we've taken a lot of the nature out of it um, and introduced things like pesticides and herbicides and uh, fertilizers um, that have you know, taken it further away from, from nature. Um, but basically, agriculture is nature. So when I arrived in Australia, I, I was looking for a scientific job, and I found it with agriculture as working for the Department of Agriculture, uh, New South Wales Department of Agriculture. And the first position I had was um, looking at pesticides, um, which wasn't what I planned, obviously, being a naturalist and running around with a butterfly net, etc. cetera. Um, my first job was testing pesticides against spider mites. And, uh, and so I learned a lot about pesticides and um, the need for them and, and their application. Um, but I obviously longed for something different, um, not sterilizing nature, which pesticides tend to do. Um, this is a, a vineyard that you know, is, is conventionally managed. Um, the weeds are mostly got rid of. Um, it, pesticides are used. And so you know, I progressed from that to, to something um, called biological control, which most of you have heard of the term biological control. Um, which basically is using uh, beneficial bugs. And there are beneficial bugs. I mean, people think of bugs or insects as uh, all bad. But the bad ones are really in the minority. The majority of insects are beneficial. The majority of bugs are beneficial. And, and we can use those beneficial bugs to control the bad bugs. This is biological control. Um, and, and that's working with nature. Back to nature, if you like. Um, most of the biological control that most of you in the room have probably heard about have been the examples where um, a, a pest has arrived in a country. And uh, to control it biologically, we go back to the country of origin and get the predator that used to feed on it and bring it into the new country where the pest is um, exploiting and, and get biological control that way. Um, so introducing uh, a natural enemy from overseas. And that can work very well. But it can also uh, work, not work as well, <coughs> um, if, particularly if the predator decides that there are other food items that it likes in its new country, as well as the pest that we want it to control. So it, that, that sort of classical biological control has had a, a checkered career. Um, a better type of biological control is conservation biological control, where we are just encouraging the natural enemies already in the environment. And as I said, most insects are good or incidental. They, they don't harm or provide benefits for us. Um, but a lot of them are good. And so it's just encouraging those good insects to occupy agricultural fields 
uh, and provide biological control. Um, that's conservation biological control. You're conserving the natural enemies um, to help control the pests. So you're, you're using nature to help control pests biologically. And so in Australia, I soon progressed from um, testing pesticides on insects and mites to testing out uh, ideas of biological control. And one of the, my major successes was uh, looking at um, mites on grapes and looking at biological control of them uh, using predatory mites. So, you know, as I said, they're good bugs and they're bad bugs. So we had bad mites and good mites. And uh, we did a bit of manipulation um, in terms of what um, pesticides were used in vineyards at the time. And this allowed, um, taking out some bad pesticides, it allowed the good predatory mites to survive. And we got biological control of, of our mites on grapevines. And, uh, and the story became wine, women, and vineyard mite control with Doreen and Victoria. It sounded like a bit of a shady DVD or video as it was at the time. Uh, but this is Doreen, um, a predatory mite uh, under high magnification, obviously. And uh, the, the mites, the predatory mites were Tiflodromus Doreenae and uh, Amblesius victoriensis. And of course, the growers, the farmers, the viticulturalists shortened those uh, names to Doreen and Victoria. So we had these women of nature in Australia, Doreen and Victoria, providing um, biological control and allowing Australian grape growers to produce wine without the use of miticides. And that, at the time, uh, saved a lot of money and opened up export markets for Australian wine in Europe, um, which had very strict regulations about chemical residues. So that's a success story of biological control, using nature to help in agriculture. Um, but, um, but we can go further than that. We can bring nature, uh, if we stay with the, the vineyard example, uh, bring nature into the vineyard, perhaps. And, uh, and then we would have more biological control agents closer to the vineyard. Uh, a lot of the biological control agents that are in the environment are well away from agriculture, uh, simply because you know, we've, we've developed around agriculture, roads, buildings, uh, infrastructure. And so the natural vegetation is usually some distance from vineyards. If we can bring that vegetation back, um, we would get better biological control simply because the natural enemies will be closer to the vineyard. Um, so bringing nature closer to, the, to agriculture. Can we have the beauty of nature with benefits? Um, beauty with benefits. And the answer is yes. Um, work that we've done recently in, in this Yakima Valley has shown that. Um, we have encouraged a number of vineyards to restore their um, the, the landscape around the vineyards, and in some cases in vineyards, with native plants um, that are the resources that, that uh, the good bugs need. And by doing this, we've shown that they can increase the number of beneficial insects. So this, this uh, simple graph here is a, a lot of data from a lot of years, um, all combined, uh, showing that the, this is the number of beneficial insects. And conventional yard is fairly low, and in nature it's very high. And with the beauty with benefits vineyards, it's somewhere in between. So we've, we've improved it beyond conventional, which has no native plants around, uh, to, a, to a much greater level, significantly greater level um, in the, the vineyards that have restored some native habitat. So there are benefits. And the beneficial insects provide biological control. And we have other graphs to show that the number of pests are reduced in the, benef uh, the beauty the beautiful vineyards, if you like. Um, so another example of, help, of nature helping. Um, uh, beauty. We have the beauty from the native plants themselves. Most of these are flowering native plants um, because the flowers are the, the main part of the plants that attract the beneficial insects uh, for nectar and pollen. Um, but we also have other, uh, other beauty through butterflies. Um, which also often use the native plants as their hosts, their caterpillar hosts. Uh, all butterflies need to develop as caterpillars on, on plants, and most of our native butterflies, well, all of them, feed as larvae on native plants. And again, a lot of data combined for a simple graph shows that in our um, beautiful vineyards, our habitat-enhanced vineyards, 
we have far more butterflies flying, both in terms of species and in abundance of uh, species, uh, in those vineyards than in the conventional vineyards. Um, so we have a dual benefit here. We have the beauty and the benefits uh, to biological control and just the aesthetic beauty. So this is a, a, t a t I'd say typical, but it, it, it's sort of a, a, the high end of the scale of a, of a beauty of benefits vineyard. Uh, this guy down the, the Columbia River Gorge um, has been doing this uh, since before we even uh, started researching the idea. Uh, so it's a well-developed beauty with benefits vineyard. Um, and you can see it lives up to its name. And he produces high quality wine with very few pests and a lot of butterflies. And these nature, so-called nature vineyards, um, we've counted the butterflies in these vineyards and we found at least 29 species typical of these vineyards and there's a selection of some of them there. Uh, compared to the conventional vineyards, and you can see the difference in the type of vineyards we're talking about. This one's you know, just got grass and, uh, and no flowers at all. And we found nine butterfly species. And most of these uh, are migrants just passing through, whereas most of the butterflies on the other slide were actually living in vineyards. So clearly, nature is occupying the vineyard in, in this instance. It can be done. Um, oops. So as part of this work, we, you know, we, we're looking at the native plants. And not all native plants are equal. Some are better than others both in the benefits to biological control of pests and also benefits to pollinators and to butterflies. Um, and I'll just highlight a couple of these here. Uh, milkweed, um, which I'm sure you've all heard of, um, probably because you know that it's the, the host plant, as we heard in an earlier, um, earlier video, uh, that it's the host plant of the monarch butterfly, uh, pictured there. So famous for that. But our work has also shown it's a great attractant for beneficial insects, the predators and parasites that help control the pests in, vineyard, in vineyards and other crops as well. And even in backyards, if by growing milkweed in your backyard, you have the potential of having monarch butterflies um, live in your garden. Uh, but you also uh, bring in more beneficial insects, more predators and parasites that will keep the numbers of pests down in your nearby vegetable garden, perhaps. Um, so there's a dual benefit from that. And it's also very good for pollinators generally, native bees. So, you know, milkweed is a great plant to grow um, for these reasons in agriculture, but also in the backyard. Um, and I think we have some seeds to give away at the conclusion of, of tonight of milkweed. Um, another plant that's also probably not as popular as milkweed, the humble stinging nettle, and it's the plant as I was promoting right at the, in the first slide, um, 40 odd years ago, um, I'm still promoting it. And I know more now than I did then, obviously. And I know now that it's also one of nature's homes for beneficial insects. Um, paper we published recently showed this. Um, the work we did over the last few years, it attracts many parasitic wasps and predatory bugs. Um, uh, it, they seem to just congregate around stinging nettles. Nobody knew this before. So you can grow stinging nettles. You, should grow stinging nettles for that reason, um, but also for the fact that it's a host for at least five species of butterflies that you'll see in the next slide um, that may turn up in your garden if you grow them. Um, so they are a beneficial plant, and, and we're in trying to encourage farmers or uh, growers to, to uh, preserve their nettle patches. I mean, most, there are a lot of nettles around, um, and it's, it's a good thing to leave them and not to destroy them. And they also make a refreshing tea, apparently. I haven't tried it myself, but you, you can try that. So the humble stinging nettle. These are the butterflies that, that may turn up in your garden if you grow stinging nettles. The red admiral, tortoiseshells, painted ladies. Um, so it, it's a win-win situation for stinging nettle. So, so the, these are some examples of, of using... Um, biological control in nature, but there are other ways we can use the nature of agriculture or the nature of the plants that we're growing. Um, all plants, as we heard in an earlier talk, are living and, and they are actually very good at surviving and defending themselves in particular. So, you know, we have pests causing damage, 
but it would be a lot worse if the crops, the plants, weren't able to defend themselves to some extent. And perhaps we can capitalize on that a little bit. Um, part of a nettle's nature is its defense. It stings for a reason to, you know, to deter mammals from eating it. Um, but other plants, well, nettles as well, all plants do other things. Uh, particularly, they, dis they emit aromas or, or um, volatiles, bouquets of volatiles, uh, chemical signals, smells, if you like. We can't smell them, but plants are always producing aromas. I mean, some plants we can smell, obviously, um, but every plant is producing aromas that, that we can't smell that are actually aimed at attracting predators. Um, they're actually distress signals. When a plant is attacked, it will release a certain bouquet of volatiles to attract a certain type of predator. Um, different plants that release different types of volatiles for different predators. Um, so it's very complex. And this, the science of this has been known now for 30 years or so, um, discovered in the laboratory at first. Um, but in recent times, and uh, I'm pleased to say I was one of the first people in the world to, to, to put this into practice in, in agriculture, um, we started looking at the use of these volatiles as ways of attracting beneficial insects to improve biological control. And um, this uh, cute picture of my daughters, if I say so myself, demonstrates that the, the, the candy they have in their mouth is, you'll all recognize as, uh, I'm sure, wintergreen, lifesaver wintergreen mints. And the chemical in that is methyl salicylate. You're eating pure methyl salicylate. It's also in toothpaste and a lot of other products that we use. So it's available commercially and readily. Um, but it's also the main volatile that every plant that's been studied so far releases when it's attacked by herbivores. Um, so it seems to be a key component of the distress signal. So we thought that that would be an obvious chemical to start with in trying to attract uh, beneficial insects into, into vineyards. And uh, we also worked in hop yards. And we did. And to cut a long story short, it certainly does attract beneficial insects. We put out synthetic methyl salicylate in a vineyard or hop yard in a dispenser, a slow-release dispenser, so it releases over a period of time, um, a couple of months. And you will find more beneficial insects in those agricultural hop yards and vineyards than in the yards that, that don't have dispensers. So um, it's... It, it works, and you can actually buy these dispensers now uh, and improve biological control. And the whole, this whole technique has moved on to looking at other, the, some other volatiles that plants produce and in other crops as well. And it's, it's, it's a worldwide literature on it now, and researchers all over the world are looking at it. So it's another example of um, ways, a way we are using the, the natural system of a plant to help us in agriculture. So, to sum up that little section, nature's sense makes sense, and also dollars too. It saves money. Um, by in increasing biological control, you have to use less pesticide. Um, we're helping agriculture. So, so there's some examples of, of nature helping agriculture. Um, but I think the, the, the thing I want to leave you with um, for the future is that um, I think you know, we're eventually going to see agriculture more as a natural system, a more of a natural ecosystem. We are moving away from monocultures, vast areas of cropping um, slowly, um, to, to areas of more diversification and more natural habitat. Uh, this isn't something that's going to happen within my lifetime, um, probably. Uh, it's going to take a number of decades to, to be fully exploited, but it is going to happen where we'll have uh, agricultural lands as wildlife conservation areas. We've already I've shown you a little bit of it already with the butterfly situation in, in Washington vineyards. And in fact, if you, if you Google butterflies and vineyards, you'll, you'll see a lot more information on this and, uh, and how it's piqued a lot of interest uh, elsewhere. Um, but the Europeans are actually doing uh, this sort of uh, research um, and have been doing so for quite some time. Um, and so agricultural lands as wildlife conservation areas is a, is a, a practical proposition for the future. Um, it goes hand in hand with the reduction in pesticide usage which is occurring 
Um, sometimes we wonder whether it really is, but if you look at the, the data um, of pesticide usage, it is declining, and just more importantly, the, the types of pesticide we're using are less broad spectrum, less, less toxic. They don't kill everything like the old chemicals do. They're usually more targeted now to kill the pests that we're looking at rather than everything. So with a situation like that, there is room for allowing butterflies, for example, and other organisms to live within agriculture if you're not using pesticides that kill everything. Um, but it's a slow process. Um, but it will happen uh, ultimately. Um, so agriculture is getting back to nature. And, uh, but it, it is a long-term thing. And it's something that most researchers in entomology and agriculture are working towards. And it's something we can all aspire to, too. And using an example from the part from just, recent, just before about the milkweed, you can grow milkweed in your own backyard and get the benefits that, that growers are getting from it um, or can get from it. Um, so I think that, that's just about my message. Thank you very much for listening.